Hello and welcome to today's live talk, the latest in a series of expert dialogues brought to you by Bayer. With a global hunger crisis looming, our topic today is the future of agriculture. What must change to achieve hunger for none? My name is Melinda Crane and it is a great pleasure to accompany you today as moderator. Russia is blocking 20 million tons of grain from being shipped out of Ukraine's Black Sea ports. Ukraine's often referred to as Europe's breadbasket because it normally produces 13% of all global corn exports and nearly 12% of international wheat. So the blockade has sent food prices soaring. Vulnerable families are tightening their belts in many parts of the Middle East and Africa. The president of the European Council has charged Russia with using food as a weapon, forcing people into poverty and hunger. Yet even before the invasion, global food supplies were anything but stable. Wheat stockpiles were already running low due to burgeoning demand, climate-related harvest losses, rising production costs, supply chain disruptions, and the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres warns of a hurricane of hunger and a meltdown of the global food system. With the world population set to top 10 billion people by 2050, we need to act now to ensure that we can feed the world's people while we preserve our planet at the same time. Joining us now to explore ways out of this food crisis are two renowned experts. Urs Nickley is one of the world's leading authorities on sustainability in agriculture. For 30 years, he has headed the Research Institute of Organic Agriculture, known by its uh, acronym FEEBLE, advising agricultural ministers and committees around the world. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has selected Urs to serve on the science group of the 2021 Food Systems Summit. And he also serves as president of agroecology.science and has been called the scientific mastermind of organic agriculture. Today, he joins us from Zurich. Welcome, Urs. Great to have you with us. Welcome, Melinda. Thank you. And I'm very, very pleased uh, to greet Matthias Berninger. He is a regular on these talks. He's executive vice president for public affairs, science, sustainability and health, S, uh, sorry, and HSE, that's health, safety and environment at Bayer. And he's architect of the group's global sustainability initiative, which follows the company's vision, health for all, hunger for none. A central focus of his work is how to feed a growing world population while still respecting planetary boundaries. And today he joins us from Washington, DC. It's great to see you again, Matthias. Great to see you and happy Monday. Great to see <laughs> you all. Thank you. So just a very quick note, ladies and gentlemen, before we start, because we're really eager to hear from you as well, please do join our discussion and you can use the comment function on this live stream for that purpose. I'll see the comments and I'll incorporate them into our discussion a little bit later on. So let's start out uh, looking a little bit at uh, at the current events in Ukraine and how they uh, do uh, link to up to our topic. The war has, in fact, triggered a major food crisis. And Urs, would you say that there is any chance to raise agricultural production in other companies, countries in the short term in order to compensate for losses of this blocked grain? Or is the time too short? Do we simply have to wait till the next harvest season? Yeah, I think it's too short uh, to have such quick, uh, quick changes. Uh, and uh, what is also important for me to mention that uh, uh, we have had for, for decades uh, a project also developing organic farming in Ukraine. And, uh, and uh, uh, I have worked together with uh, group of scientists and uh, for me the most amazing thing was that uh, uh, the idea of organic farming helped to empower people and uh, I think for democracy the such uh, 
development have become very important and that's why I'm really sad about development. Many, many organic farmers have completely stopped producing wheat. Absolutely. Um, not least because of their their uncertainty, uncertainty, of course, uh, for their own lives and their families, but also uncertainty about whether they would be able to sell uh, their their crops. Let me go over to Matthias. And Matthias, Bayer has published a statement on Ukraine and Putin's unlawful invasion that, in fact, attracted a good deal of notice. And amongst other support initiatives that you're undertaking, you're providing seeds and agricultural inputs to help small farmers in Ukraine. Can you tell us a little bit more about the current situation with regard to agricultural production overall and also bears related activities that I just mentioned? Yeah, first of all, I have to say that um, uh, it can't, you can't get to much braver uh, farmers than those in Ukraine because despite the risks they uh, had to take uh, getting out there, um, uh, a lot of crop has basically been sown and is now being taken care of in Ukraine. So farmers are active uh, on their fields wherever they have the necessary means, for example, also the fuels. Uh, they really um, uh, uh, try to secure the 2022 crop. Um, but of course, they face challenges. Um, the most extreme one is that there are mines, uh, uh, even other explosives on their fields. And um, uh, that is something hard to imagine for, for those who anyway have a, a huge distance to rural communities. The biggest challenge is that um, even a successful crop in 2022 uh, doesn't have the necessary storage capabilities because the storage capabilities are partially destroyed deliberately, I must say, by the Russian invasion, uh, in, invaders. And partially they are full because um, we cannot export um, the amounts of grains uh, of last year's harvest via the Black Sea. So the big, big challenge in the Ukraine is how do you keep the agriculture system going? Um, and um, I would say that we are no longer in a scenario where you could say this war is not dragging on for a long time. Today's attacks on um, on a shopping center, yesterday's attacks uh, in, in many cities in the Ukraine indicate that this war will be with us for quite a while. Uh, the more we need to find ways to support uh, 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 growers in, in the Ukraine. And for us, concretely, it means the question, um, how can we double down on our investments, strengthening uh, farmers in the Ukraine? That's what our teams are working on at the moment. And uh, let me just ask you as a, as a quick follow up, because I know you have your ear to the ground, as it were, uh, when it comes to the blockade uh, that is affecting grain shipments out of Ukraine. Do you have the sense that the blockade will be lifted in time to avert a major global food crisis? or that other ways of getting the grain out, perhaps land routes, in fact, will, will come through in time? I think we will have all kinds of ways to get grain out of the Ukraine. However, um, the amounts are nowhere near what you would ship from a deep sea port like the one in Odessa. And that is the problem. So qualitatively, yes, a lot of alternative paths are being pursued. And as we speak here, this is also discussed during the G7 meeting. Uh, however, um, uh, the quantities will not meet the global needs. And most importantly, the World Food Program is in dire need to have additional grains to feed, for example, people who suffer from acute hunger in South Sudan, uh, in Yemen, and, and, and many other countries. So um, my hope still is that there will be something like a blue corridor uh, UN supported and respected by um, uh, the Russian aggressor, aggressors that would allow exports from Odessa. The reality though is we see targeted attacks on grain storage, on other agriculture infrastructure since the war began. Uh, and that is why I believe that um, uh, Putin is trying to use hunger as an extended weapon in his aggression. As the UN Secretary General said, uh, let me ask uh, Urs uh, to comment on another aspect uh, of the, the repercussions of the Ukraine conflict, and it regards the, um, the European Green Deal. The EU 
as part of this uh, plan, aims to make 25% of farmland organic by 2030. And its farm to fork strategy, as it's called, is seeking to improve food security while reducing pesticides and fertilizer use. Now we're hearing these targets and these aspects of the Green Deal being called into question because of the food shortages stoked by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. What's your perspective on the trade-offs and the calls that we're hearing for these uh, these provisions to essentially be suspended temporarily? I hope that um, the EU Commission won't change the plans of the Green Deal because uh, uh, the I think both goals, uh, like 25% organic farming, but also a reduction of uh, of uh, nitrogen and the reduction of pesticides make sense not only in the short term but also in the in the long term and uh, um, for, I think what is the most uh, essential thing is that uh, w we have a deficit in European agriculture that we have we do not have enough farmers who really understand the system approach to agriculture production. Everybody talks about that, but but uh, but n n not enough farmers really practice that. And I think the idea of having 25% organic farmers is really to develop the, the idea and the knowledge and the know-how of farmers to think in systems and to combine measures to understand complexity, and that's very, very important. And and um, and so, in in a way, it's a training camp for becoming good, excellent farmers. And uh, the the other goal of re of of reducing uh, inputs, it's clear that uh, this is this can be done. Uh, quite easily, and a lot of, of uh, science, the scientific results show that. He, he, for instance, the INRA study that 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 half of the, the the pesticide load could be reduced without uh, generating a higher uh, risk for for the economic situation of the farmers, and even for the productivity. And and also nitrogen is uh, is is um, is used too much. So we need to to tackle with that problem to become more efficient. We see that um, um, the the efficiency as a first step, increasing efficiency meaning uh, input output ratio is the first step towards. Uh, becoming more agroecological and uh, and the, the second step is uh, and the third are understanding farming systems as complex uh, systems is is the third the second and the third uh, step so it makes so much sense so i hope that uh, it uh, it won't the policy won't be changed let me ask you also, uh, Matthias, uh, to comment on that, but also particularly in the context of the fact that the current food shortage is now boosting demand for not only seeds, but also for weed killers and pest control products uh, that are designed, of course, to boost uh, crop production and thereby increase uh, agricultural yields overall. Uh, does that essentially make Bayer a winner in this crisis? No, not at all. The reason why we don't see ourselves as a winner in this crisis is that uh, we have seen uh, our own facilities being targeted to, to attacks by cruise missiles. Um, we also see that um, our customers struggle because uh, the cost, for example, for fertilizer went up more than three times. Um, we have um, uh, uh, growers who don't really know how much uh, yield um, uh, their production will uh, ultimately uh, produce this year. For example, in Europe, where roughly 10% of the global fertilizers are being produced, uh, the gas shortage 
has significantly uh, depressed production. So I think um, this food crisis only has losers, uh, most notably the poorest people in the world. Um, and and, and that's, that's the challenge we are facing. Uh, I want to I want to go back to this question, uh, should we change the direction of the uh, Green New Deal? Um, we at Bayer believe we should not. Uh, and the reason why we should not uh, is linked to uh, the water you are just drinking, uh, Melinda. We have <laughs> heat waves um, depressing yield uh, in parts of Europe. We have seen that in India and Pakistan. Before that, in, uh, uh, in China, we had four winter droughts in a row in Hungary. Um, the uh, central and eastern part of, of Germany is, is, is facing drought in, uh, in really dramatic ways. So I've, I sense that um, uh, there is a realization that we need climate action to ensure our food system produces enough food. Uh, and that is why the simple trade-off, let's pause everything and go back to how we produced in the 1970s or 80s, is, is not working. That will be at the expense of planetary boundaries and the cost for those who try to uh, see benefits in that will be very high. Um, the most shocking number for me is even if we were to reach the 1.5 degree target, we would lose between 8 and 12 percent depending on the crop of yield, just because of heat, just because of drought, just because of other extreme weather events. So my challenge to the European Union is be as radical as you are on biodiversity and climate action, on inviting innovation in. Because the challenge is without inviting innovation to the party, um, we will run out of steam very quickly. Um, and that is where Europe is relatively slow. It's the Silicon Valley of regulation, but it's not the most welcoming uh, part of the world when it comes to innovative solutions. Very interesting. And I do want to drill a little bit deeper in a moment on innovation. But first, let's talk some more about organic farming. And I have a, a question that has come in from a member of the audience, which goes to Urs Nigli. The question is this, looking at the continuously increasing population in the world and the recent war threats, could organic farming be able to meet the demand for food? And if yes, then how? Yeah, I think this, uh, qu I have been asked these questions in the last uh, uh, 33 years uh, uh, permanently. And uh, basically, I think it's a stupid question because uh, globally organic farming is 2% uh, of, uh, of the land area. And uh, so uh, it, we cannot up, up mainstream upscale that to 100 percent and i think that um, uh, to to think that there is one bullet point solution and and in 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 that thinking organic could feed the world it is all we can also call it a bullet point solution the solution sol uh, uh, solving all the problems and this is not possible. The diversity of farming systems around the globe is so huge, and and uh, and each region needs to develop its own approach to sustainability, and th that will result in um, in a huge diversity of solutions. And uh, and uh, so organic farming. Uh, will play a role for sure and it will play a role especially where the markets is are and uh, because the, the the per air per land area advantages like biodiversity by like soil fertility are 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 very are very um, positive uh, we can we can uh, we can support um uh, d d these these developments with organic farming, but uh, but th there are s really certain limits, technological limits, but also the higher land use is is uh, will be will become uh, a limitation uh, for for organic farming. That's very clear, and. Uh, 
what uh, what the Ukraine crisis has shown is that the the eyes on which we feel secure concerning the global uh, food security is very 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 thin and uh, and uh, and because uh, i have i have heard a lot in the past uh, already now with conventional farmer farming we produce enough food for 12 12 billion people so we so uh, productivity is no longer an issue but now we realize that it is an issue and uh, and and uh, yeah it's it's clear that that the, the land reserves are limited we can use for arable cropping systems so 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 let me ask you then does it does that make organic products essentially a luxury good if i look around my neighborhood i live in the heart of berlin and i have three organic uh, grocery stores selling a lot of agricultural uh, products uh, within a couple of hundred meters of where I sit right now. Does that mean there will be a segmented kind of market where uh, people in urban centers, uh, middle class people are uh, the market for these products, but that they aren't really an essential part of global food production? No, I... Uh... I have eaten my entire life organic food and I'm happy about that because uh, an organic farm represents an image of a farm I like. I have a, a, a very spontaneously a positive attitude to that kind of farm and to that kind of farm manager. So uh, in a way, it, it, I, I understand that many people really are 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 committed to organic farming, and um, it is uh, and in the past food has been anyway uh, uh, not not have not having the the the, the right price uh, food should have. So in a way, those people who 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 could afford to to pay a real price for at least for organic food, that that I'm I, I think it's it's ideal that uh, these people have done it, but it's and locally for instance especially in 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 very sensitive regions uh, uh, it is it is the ideal management of land because it keeps uh, soils fertile and it it maintains preserves biodiversity so it it makes sense but it's not the solution it's mm -hmm. not a it's it, it is okay. essential for those who eat and for those who produce it's a good solution but it's not a global one so so matthias um a slight paradox there and a, a thought leader on organic uh, agriculture who warns that still uh, organic agriculture isn't a silver bullet uh, solution and let me ask you about a paradox perhaps in your own case, uh, you're a former member of uh, the parliament and uh, also a Green Party, uh, former Green Party state secretary. And you were part of a group at that time that clearly favors organic over conventional farming. Today, you're working for Bayer, which is a firm that produces chemical products for agriculture. So often these two sides are seen as irreconcilably opposed uh, organic farming on the one hand and modern crop cultivation techniques on the other. Are they mutually exclusive? Perhaps I listened too much for the better part of 20 years to what Urs has to say. So that's why I don't think that they are irreconcilable. Um, uh, I mean, Bayer produces uh, organic seeds, uh, we produce biologicals, uh, we even produce some uh, 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 like pesticides that are approved for organic farming. And we are obviously also helpful when, for example, in, in the area of wine production, organic farmers need help uh, with chemistry because they are not able um, in, in, in some years to kind of uh, uh, rescue their, their production. 
Um, I, th I think uh, personally that um, the debate on agriculture is, is too much following the us versus them paradigm. Partially because that helped with the sales of organic farming products, partially because when organic farmers uh, started to move from a very tiny minority to an outspoken um, minority with, with much more societal support, there was a lot of infighting going on in the agricultural community. And as much as organic farming uh, will not be the solution to the global food crisis, we need to talk about that more than a third of all land uh, is being used to produce feed, fibers and fuels. So we have an agricultural system that uses all kinds of inputs, including fertilizers, certainly land um, uh, uh, in ways that is uh, also wasteful. And I'm not even talking about food waste as an additional challenge here. So in many ways, um, the food system would really benefit from a much more differentiated uh, conversation. One of the things organic farmers uh, have been practicing is agriculture without using artificial fertilizers. And I really spent a lot of time looking at how organic farmers are doing that, because I believe we need to reduce the overall amount of fertilizer uh, in order to have less carbon emissions and in order to uh, uh, improve both uh, water quality as well as uh, uh, the general soil health. Also crop rotations. Um, uh, organic farmers have been adding quite a few interesting crop rotations that might help us in the future, not only with um, uh, carbon removal, improving soil health, but also with using idle time on land to produce additional, uh, for example, uh, 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 plant-based oils, or, or, or nitrogen that, that, that could be used uh, in, in, in the crop rotation in different ways. So cover crops uh, play an important role. As soon as we start to move away from kind of putting both sides, organic and conventional agriculture as two polar opposites, and as soon as we start to be curious about what could help us in the current crisis, uh, the whole debate is much more relaxed, I believe. Very, very interesting. Um, essentially, what you're telling us is that we're we're too binary or either or when we look at organic uh, yeah. as opposed to conventional. Let me ask uh, Ors, because you have been called, I'm quoting, an undogmatic bridge builder. So how do you build a bridge between these two sides, between organic and conventional farming? Yeah, it, has, it hasn't been an easy walk so far. Um, uh, to, to add so, to something uh, which was mentioned by Matthias, uh, uh, so it's true that uh, many uh, many chemical companies or breeding companies nowadays uh, have have uh, become very active in selling products for organic farming, and um, and the problem is that. Uh, for instance, for for horticulture, special crops, uh, uh, we in organic farming also need um, uh, this biocontrol uh, or, or or natural products uh, because uh, forty percent or forty five percent of all pesticides in uh, in Germany and in in Middle Europe are used in horticultural crops and not in uh, arable crops. So, and their uh, organic and conventional farmers have the same problems they need because uh, with uh, with permanent crops like a, like a, vi a, vi a vineyard or an apple orchard, you cannot you cannot solve problems by by, uh, by co a higher complexity of the cropping systems you have you have apples and you have wine and that's it and so um, there we have the same problems and um, and so far um, Bayer for instance hasn't really invested into new products because there is a urgent need for new products many of the companies also the the big ones sell all the old stuff which had which had been used for 20 30 years in organic farming 
and we need a dramatic innovation there. And I think that's that, that's uh, that's something I expect Bayer to do uh, because they have the the financial background to develop completely new products from scratch, and um, and and they do they don't do it and uh, and that for instance that biocontrol and natural compounds helping to suppress uh, diseases for instance th 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 that is a common interest of conventional farmers and um, and uh, and organic farmers because uh, uh, consumer in general have a problem with uh, pesticides so called pesticides that would that, that would be a, a very a very first step i would appreciate uh, done by buyer then let's hear Matthias's response to that. Yeah, I mean, uh, you were very like black and white. We don't do it. Uh, I think that's that's not really fair to uh, our researchers you'll, because you'll we are doing it. You yeah, sell it, are, yeah, but you maybe don't. Maybe we, do we, we are not uh, uh, successful enough in it, but um, uh, we have quite a few biologicals in the program, exactly in the space you described, the horticultures. I also want to say what we are doing in breeding where we replace traditional chemistry, for example, in the insect uh, uh, and insecticide space uh, with, uh, uh, with both uh, uh, GMO seeds as well as gene edited seeds um, are, uh, are things that, that are often not being recognized, but it's also replacing basically um, chemistry, uh, sometimes year old chemistry uh, or years old chemistry with biology. And just recently, was we we uh, created a partnership with a U.S. company called Ginkgo Bioworks, where we put everything we know about biology uh, biologics um, into a joint uh, venture with everything they know about it. And Ginkgo is, and we know that from the pharmaceutical space, one of the leading players uh, in dealing with biologicals. Um, I think there is a lot happening in the space, um, but I agree that the pressure. Uh, also, in part, as a result of climate change, uh, that some of the special uh, cultures are experiencing um, uh, is insurmountable for them. Uh, and that is also why I'm so keen on driving innovation. Climate change is happening at a fast pace, certainly faster than I had expected 20 years ago. Um, and we need to be able to help those farmers and adjust for that. We need um, much more openness to new technologies like gene editing. Uh, and I would say uh, it would be for organic farming a real step forward if these kind of products, for example, alternative fertilizers uh, that are based on microbes would also be accessible to organic farmers. I want to come back to the question of gene editing, but I want to just give was a quick a quick chance to respond to this. Uh, if uh, but but I, I I want to go to gene editing in a moment. So do you have any other response you would like to uh, to give to what we just heard from Matthias? No, I think there we have some uh, similar uh, approaches because uh, uh, the. Um, manipulating uh, the, the microbiome of the soil. So, so all the microorganisms uh, which are in the soil, but also there is a microbiome on the leaves of the crops. Yeah. And, uh, and we, meanwhile, basic science sees so many interactions with, with, with what happens in the soil, what happens on the leaves, and and how it influences the productivity and the health of um, of plants, and finally the the, the, the yield. And uh, and I think the, the, there is a is common ground for further development. And um, my, my former colleagues uh, doing a lot of, of organic breeding. They look especially at these interactions, mm -hmm. and um, and and from tropical uh, climate, we know that this this manipulating interaction between soils uh, uh, via microbiomes and plants that this can be in certain cases a very successful strategy, and I I think that uh, there we have common ground. I agree. 
and um, and this is this is really a way where organic farming could open the up. And Matthias, before we move on uh, to talk a little bit more about uh, uh, genetics, let me just uh, pose another audience question that has come in that that relates essentially to your call to try to decrease uh, fertilizer use and also uh, the need for more innovation. Muntazar Al Hamad. Hamadi is asking, what about farming algae to produce fertilizers and feed animals? Do you consider these products nowadays or are they too expensive? We, are, we, are, we have invested in companies that work on algae, for example, um, on algae that produces um, the basic um, uh, fatty acids uh, or oils uh, that you could use uh, in um, in uh, sustainable airline fuels, um, we have partnerships here with large, um, also oil companies on that one. Um, and of course, the byproduct of it would be um, a very good fertilizer. So I believe uh, algae are an interesting platform. However, um, they, there has always been this huge promise, and our researchers tell us we are still a bit out to kind of deliver against the promise. I also see a lot of promise in seaweed. Um, uh, in this case, for example, as a uh, as a part of uh, of um, ruminant feed for cows, uh, in order to reduce methane emissions, and overall create a good uh, protein-rich uh, um, uh, uh, feed mix uh, for them as well. So, uh, not only because those uh, uh, crops are really interesting, also because we have enough salt water and a shortage of fresh water uh, going forward in the. Uh, climate change um, uh, uh, kind of ridden world, uh, I believe we need to look into blue technology. Um, we do it um, not with the same intensity as we work on that though. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit more now about uh, gene editing. And uh, Urs, Bayer uh, argues that genetically improved crops are crucial to feeding the world's growing population in an ecologically balanced way. Would you agree with that? And what role do you think gene editing will play in agriculture in the future? Yeah, I think uh, you and Matthias exactly know what I will respond to that question. Uh, and uh, basically, I think that, uh, and this has nothing to do with organic, because organic has a clear profile and and uh, the, 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 the you cannot express in a more profiled way the, the what organic is than saying it's against chemical pesticides, it's against uh, not applying chemical fertilizer and being GMO free. So me, me as a marketing guy, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, uh, leave this clear distinction from uh, between organic and conventional food understood by all the consumers uh, but of course organic farming is much more than that but this is a simple communication and um, uh, but looking at from the perspective of, of global food um, security it is clear that uh, we 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 need many options. We need really many options, and uh, and new breeding technologies are one option. And we cannot. Uh, I think humanity won't um, won't co won't come to a decision that this option. Um, this option shouldn't be needed because it opens up a lot of a lot of a lot of uh, so potentially successful development, and and especially when, um, when, when what is now developing uh, CRISPR-Cas was yeah, only the first step. Now there we have a, a, a wide range of new developments. Becoming, uh, beca beca becoming even more precise and uh, and using different mechanisms, 
and um, and we we have all the the research into into MR, mRNA technologies, for instance, for producing pesticides, very specific ones, and uh, this is also a completely new way, and um, the, the 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 genomic selection with with combining uh, uh, IT facilities, uh, digitalization, um, massive data um, processing with genetic and with phenotyping, with phenotype, genotyping and phenotyping, speeding up selections, selection, and um, so all these uh, technologies are coming. And I, I would be completely incredible as a scientist to say this is all stupid or this cannot be used or shouldn't be used. Thank you. And um, you mentioned a technology that has, in fact, become the most popular gene editing tool, namely CRISPR. And Matthias, you've referred to that uh, technology as a bio-revolution. Can you explain the difference between gene editing the way it was in earlier times and the use of tools like CRISPR? The main difference is that um, with CRISPR, you can do both, but uh, you can certainly uh, change the genome of a plant without adding, for example, with so-called so virus vectors, uh, genetics from other organisms. So, for example, we can create a shorter corn uh, that is uh, still very high in yield and more robust uh, when it comes to drought or to extreme weather events like storms. Um, uh, by using those technologies, we just accelerate the breeding process um, in ways we couldn't do before. We can also silence genes, uh, which helps to avoid the use of insecticides. We've done that in papaya, we've done it in cassava, uh, recently approved in Kenya, and uh, we now introduce similar technology in corn. Um, this wouldn't have been possible without the added precision and also the cost of, um, of genomics going down at such a rapid uh, pace. Um, the bio-revolution for me is this magic intersection of artificial intelligence, new frontier chemistry, uh, and uh, the possibilities of gene editing and other technologies uh, in the space. Um, and, and that bio-revolution has brought us a lot already, including vaccines, um, and it, it will bring a lot in the plant uh, uh, space as well. Um, organic farming. Um, has one of one other marketing advantage, and that is that um, animal husbandry rules in organic farming um, are taking much more care of animal welfare than in the traditional, let's say, legal minimum that is required. And organic farming has no problem to give up that marketing advantage to the benefit of a broader animal population. Um, I feel um, uh, it's worth to give up the quote-unquote marketing advantage on the gene editing side as well, uh, because the benefits that could come with new nutritionals, with biologicals that we need for the uh, speciality crops we talked about earlier, or just with better seeds that can withstand certain climate-related uh, challenges, far outweigh the quote-unquote marketing benefit. That's my personal point of view, but... Um, I know within the organic movement that is being discussed one way or the other. My hope is that still this doesn't lead to slowing down the introduction of uh, uh, genome editing and other technologies uh, uh, in Europe because we need it in Europe. Um, other regions, including Africa, including South America, including now China, have been uh, on a very different uh, planet here. And I think Europe should... Uh, should not wait much longer. And the good news is the Commission sees that pretty much the same way I see it, but it also requires some restraint from the organic movement to not mobilize um, what I would say more panicky um, uh, kind of emotions against the promise of this technology. Thank you very much. Uh, Urs, I'm going to come back to you with a request for a brief response to that, if you would, because uh, we don't have a lot of time left on the clock. But you basically gave us a very nuanced answer just now, saying that uh, lack or, or that in the organic movement, 
not using GMO is a big marketing advantage and you implied uh, or more or less said that you can't imagine uh, that being given up. Now, we've just heard Matthias say, uh, but you know what, maybe, maybe that prohibition, that taboo uh, needs to be questioned. Yeah, uh, I won't be in the position to make any decision. So uh, the good thing about organic farming is that uh, it is farmer driven and farmer take the, the decisions. And uh, so uh, it's not it's not it's not scientists. Uh, scientists can can give some advice. And um, so it's not my, it's my, it's not my role to make any decision. And uh, what I think it's very good is that organic farming has always been an alternative pathway for solutions. That was uh, the same when, 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 the, when, when all the pesticides had been a revolution. Uh, then uh, for, uh, organic farmers said, we won't use them. And so th this kind of feeling to, to to act as a in a role of always representing an alternative pathway that gives the society options for decisions and i think this has also to be to be uh, thought of and and some things which are not yet regulated is uh, that uh, organic farmers are completely against patents on on uh, on on microorganism patents on plants on living organisms uh, here uh, the european seed association i know from them that they try to find some kind of um, of european modification to the to the patents and many uh, colleague of uh, with whom i discussed it uh, conventional or, or molecular breeders, they say, basically it was it was a thought we run into that uh, the patents were accepted in, in Europe. And, um, and what is also not yet solved is the question of what is in the pipeline. And that, that I, I often heard that it, uh, it, a lot of promises, but nothing around, nothing which can be planted. So the, the, I think that the, the best uh, thing uh, the, 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 the breeders could do is really to come up with, with uh, plants, crop plants, varieties, which are suited uh, to, to be embedded and to improve complex farming systems. That would be the, that would be a, uh, the, the, that would facilitate uh, um, uh, the, the, the acceptance of GMO. And, and Urs, I, I have two examples for you that um, also will work together in a new system. Uh, one is uh, short corn. Uh, we talked about short corn uh, uh, for quite a while. It takes time to introduce these products in the market, uh, but you can see it already growing in Africa and Mexico. Um, in South Africa, I have to say, to be precise, in Mexico and in uh, the United States. Uh, this will allow us to, pr to basically produce the same amount of corn with 20% less land. And the other example is a new cover crop that will be used during idle times. It's a cress-based cover crop um, uh, that basically will enrich the soil, will be carbon neutral in the production and yield additional, um, uh, 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 in this case, oils and, and, and feed um, uh, to, to, to be used, for example, in sustainable airline uh, fuel. So uh, these are all examples where gene editing is already making a difference. They will come to market, but since we talk about agriculture, it can't be a chicken and egg. Yeah? Yeah. You cannot, on the one hand, in Europe say, I don't want this, and then complain that it is not there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So hey. I feel a bit more welcoming um, uh, 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 a bit more welcoming demeanor for innovation would help us. But the examples are there. We have a two and a half million uh, uh, dollar R&D budget um, and I could spend quite some time rattling down examples. 
uh, uh, and a lot of young researchers will, will echo what I'm saying. So I feel like um, let's welcome the innovation and then see whether it's so attractive that even organic farmers in their decision groups may move to adopt some of these technologies. Yeah, basically that's the way forward. And uh, uh, I have been standing twice in the in the in the glass house of Gaisha Goa, uh, the, the 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 most famous Chinese breeder, uh, with uh, working with CRISPR Cas, and uh, she showed me glass houses full of extremely interesting uh, varieties. So I know what is there. And uh, in a way, uh, many people uh, talk about use self-fulfilling, uh, um, how do you say, pro, 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 profit? Pro prophecies. Prophecies, yeah. Uh, because uh, on the one hand, they say it's nothing there. On the, on the, on the other hand, they do everything to, 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 uh, to, to ban it. So mm -hmm. uh, the, the mechanism is clear, but a, a, a breakthrough can only come by by presenting good varieties. Agreed. Th thank you. Let, let me just bring in a couple more audience questions, if I may. And the first one comes from uh, Mohammed Irfan, and I'll put it to Matthias. How can we fix carbon in our soils by natural or microbial activity. So as we all know, soils are a crucial carbon sink. In fact, we've even discussed that here in our LinkedIn live talks uh, with you, Matthias. Uh, do you have a question, a, a comment for Mohammed? Yeah, I mean, first of all, um, we know that tilling mobilizes a lot of carbon. Uh, uh, carbon. So the less we, uh, we till, um, the more we uh, are able to uh, avoid tilling, uh, the more carbon we can keep in the soil. Secondly, um, uh, we need to focus our breeding much more on root systems. So not only on the yield, let's say the grains uh, we would harvest, but much more on root systems because root systems play a crucial role in addition uh, in, the, in, the, in the function of, it, uh, of adding soil. Then, um, crop rotations are really important. I think uh, there should always be something growing on a piece of land, so really, really crucial. The good news is there is enough carbon in the atmosphere, so we don't need to produce that. Unfortunately, we produce too much of it. But one thing is absolutely essential, and that is water. So the connection between water and the ability of soil to store carbon is uh, uh, one we should not underestimate. Um, my sense is that farmers can play a crucial role in removing carbon out of the atmosphere. But in order for this to really work, we also need to work on uh, reducing the overall energy needs in agriculture. So the amount of petrol, the amount of fuel um, uh, that is being used in agriculture needs to be addressed because otherwise we would spend a lot of petrol on capturing carbon in a soil and on balance, we may not uh, achieve much. So it's really important to decarbonize agriculture while agriculture decarbonizes our atmosphere. Thank you very much. Um, a wonderful uh, loop there, if you would. Um, let me also bring in a question from Shiv Kumar Patil, who asks, um, Sri Lanka previously banned chemical fertilizers in the country to promote organic farming. That resulted in massive food crises in the country and organic farming practices went catastrophically wrong. Urs Nikli, what is your comment on that event? Yeah, it's uh, obvious that uh, organic farming is very knowledge intensive and uh, the farmer is, is really at uh, in the center of uh, of the management system, so uh, so uh, it's it's really important that any conversion strategies towards organic farming are accompanied by by training, by knowledge accumulation, by uh, empowering farmers, uh, because uh, he needs to make a lot of observations. He make he needs to make a lot of decisions, and he cannot delegate decisions to to any kind of uh, 
of tool or of compound he can spray. So uh, I think knowledge is uh, crucial for development, the development of organic farming. And, uh, and that's why it, it can become a failure. Thank you very much. And, uh, yes, uh, please. One, one, one short answer to uh, Matthias. Uh, what you mentioned is uh, basically uh, what I also agree. The agriculture can learn a lot, really a lot from organic farmers. And, uh, and this is all what can be, be described as solving problems via complexity, via knowledge, and via system approach. And, on, and, on, and I cannot see a future without the tremendous knowledge and the, the approach of organic farmers. And the problem is that um, uh, the, the, in organic farming, the restrictions are quite uh, fundamental against high tech, and uh, and therefore for for the, the, the huge areas like 95% of the global land, the combination between organic knowledge and between high tech might become the solution. But that doesn't mean that organic have to embrace all this technology. They have to cons consequently uh, follow up on the system approach and to professionalize that. It, it's interesting, Urs, because um, I think when we talk about innovation, we often automatically assume that we're talking about uh, high tech. But in a way, you're telling us that organic farming, although actually uh, not seeking to be high tech is innovative because of its systemic approach. In exactly. other words, the yeah. mindset itself is innovative. Very interesting. Exactly. Let me let me just ask both of you uh, finally to sort of widen out your perspective. We've talked about the challenges in producing enough food for a growing world population in a sustainable way. And we've also talked about some very interesting solutions that modern agriculture, as well as organic agriculture, do provide. So um, I'd like to ask you, Matthias, what needs to happen for these solutions to be implemented at scale? Because as we said, uh, we've got a major challenge to reaching this zero hunger goal. In fact, some people would say it's unattainable. Well, in the 1950s, two thirds of all humans had acute food shortages. Um, that number went down to roughly 11%. And during that time, the world population uh, doubled twice. Um, so if you will, agriculture productivity has increased by a factor of, I wanna say eight or nine, depending on how you calculate that. That gives me a lot of optimism that there are a lot of smart people who can figure out to increase the amount of food production and to rebalance the production of food, fuel, and fibers. And of course, to rebalance the production of food and feed, uh, because uh, we do not need to consume 80 to 90 kilograms of meat uh, to lead a healthy life. Japan, parts of France are more in the 30, 40 kilogram range. And I don't think that they suffer from, from doing that. So there's a lot that needs to happen. And my optimism is, um, is basically driven by the changes that have happened. For example, the transition within animals away from mammals, more to birds, and the transitions uh, that we see as a result of innovation. The North Star though is to respect planetary boundaries. The success between 1950 and today did not respect planetary boundaries in the way we need to do that in the future. And that, of course, is exactly that systemic perspective uh, that Urs has been uh, talking about. Urs, you've worked as an advisor for agricultural ministers and committees around the world. If you were in charge of global agricultural policy for one day, what would be your key priority? Just in a sentence or two, if you would, because I'm afraid we're out of time. Yeah, uh, you talked about uh bridges and building bridges, I think is the most important thing because we all have 
uh, too many things in common. And, and, uh, and uh, I think to use the entire knowledge, the traditional knowledge, the tacit knowledge, the indigenous knowledge of farmers, also from the from the global south, from from the Amazon regions, together with technology, that 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 makes me very very optimistic that we will feed uh, 10 billion people without any problems. Thank you. That is a wonderful note to end this very, very interesting discussion on. I would like to say a very warm thank you to both of you, Urs Nigli, Matthias Banninger, for taking the time to talk about this crucial topic uh, today with us. And also thank you so much to our audience, to everyone who has dialed in from time zones all around the world. I wish you uh, a very good summer, stay healthy and safe, and hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.